-hmm. Okay, so again, we're here with Maria Ivancheva, who is an anthropologist and sociologist of higher education and labor. She's a senior lecturer at the School of Education, University of Strathclyde, Glasgow. Her academic and research-driven advocacy work focus on the ca casualization and digitalization of academic labor, the reproduction of intersectional inequalities at universities and high-skilled labor markets, and the role of academic and student communities in broader processes <clears throat> of social change, especially in trans transitions to from socialism. I had the real pleasure of having um, a conversation with Maria recently in New York with some other friends. And I also want to add to what Maria's bio says here that she is an active participant in all sorts of interesting social justice struggles across the world. And I got to know a little bit of Maria's work through the brilliant work that um, she is doing with others at Left East, which is a great organization. And I highly recommend checking out their analysis, especially around the war in Ukraine, which I find to be really intelligent and nuanced. So thank you so much, Maria. Um, it is one o'clock or so where Maria is right now. I really appreciate you making the time to talk with us. And um, the way we're going to structure this is Maria is going to present some ideas from the book. And then we'll leave plenty of time open for questions and answers and have some dialogue. So it's over to you, Maria. And thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, thanks, uh, Jason. And thanks to the Debt Collective for the invitation. So as Jason says, I would be, you know, speaking about my book, The Alternative Universities Lessons from Bolivar and Venezuela, which just came out in June 2023. I will first read an excerpt and then discuss some of the book's context and text and then open it up. I'm hoping that I'll be done in 30, 35 minutes and then we'll have enough time. But if you have any clarifying questions or, you know, anything, you feel free to interrupt, intervene. Um, so starting with this excerpt, so it was the fifth day of a week long course of teachers training for academics at the Bolivarian University in Venezuela. Just a second. This is to say the excerpt is from chapter three, which is called Evaluation Matters Teachers Training at an Alternative University. It was the fifth day of week long, week long course of teachers training for academics at the Bolivarian University of Venezuela, which I will hereafter call UBV. Divided into four small working groups and split into five discussion groups, the UBV faculty were doing on the job training uh, to pass from adjunct status to full faculty member status. Held outside Caracas, the course was offered to faculty members who joined the university in one of the first cohorts, that is around 2003, and wish to remain in permanent employment. After submitting their application materials earlier in the academic year, the whole cohort of faculty had to undergo awareness raising training or in Spanish, sensibilization. After listening to lectures and participating in group discussions, they had to produce group presentations which form part of their overall evaluation. The training took place at the National Education Center Simon Rodriguez on the outskirts of Caracas. The modern cluster type building had a canteen and small bar, group floor, ground floor classrooms and dorms that took up the building's upper floors. During the training week, UBV faculty listened to lectures in the mornings, met in discussion groups in the afternoons, and then gathered for debates and presentations in a few larger working groups. On the evening of the fifth day, a special guest attended the large discussion group I had joined. Pedro Pablo Linares was a former member of the student movement at the Central University of Venezuela, and, of its fac and part of its faculty for decades. While still teaching at the Central University, he had also a distinguished professorship at the Bolivarian University, which was the new university. Highly respected by the UBE by faculty, Linares was arguably one of Venezuela's best forensic anthropologists who excavated several mass graves where members of the student and underground left were buried during the 
the period nowadays referred to as the Venezuelan Fourth Republic or the liberal democracy from 1958 to 1998. A man in his 60s with dark gray hair and a beard, Linares was dressed in a cream colored linen costume with a colorfully embroidered collar. His stature in the room was that of academic, political, and personal authority. Once he entered the faculty members, all of his juniors in academic positions and most in age, toned down their nervous bus and arranged to start their presentations. All members of the five small working groups um, were sitting around tables scattered in different parts of the room. Um, Linares observed the discussion from a chair next to the door. The essay were presented on the day's topic of critical hermeneutics. Thais, a lecturer in social management from UBV Caracas, um, who was from the small working group I had joined, started first. She diligently yet passionately read out loud. And I'm quoting her. The Bolivarian current affirms critical hermeneutics as the constructive and holistic knowledge that upheaves the same knowledge from the analytical to the synthetic level and vice versa, which means to say from the macro to the micro and from the micro to the micro in the field of dialectics with its effects and contradictions and so forth. Once she had stopped, the room remained silent in anticipation of Linares' reaction. He did not say anything, yet the furrow between his eyebrows had gotten deeper. The room gradually livened up with the applause for ties. Then the moderator called on another presentation, a senior female faculty from UVV Caracas, Aria Vega, who had gained the affection of her colleagues over the previous days with her expressive humor, started presenting the work of the group. Using PowerPoint slides, including long excerpts of similarly complicated vocabulary, she proclaimed finally, UBV's pioneering crow in the global class struggle against Eurocentric, Eurocentric academic epistemology. At the end of her speech, Pet, pa, Pedro Pablo Linares suddenly stood up, interrupting the applause. Evidently out of patience, he said that what he heard so far was surprising and disillusioning as a format. And I quote him, we cannot criticize the traditional university as if we were not part of it, as if it were them and not us who erred. Glancing at the faces around the room, he stated, I expect you to use your own words to speak of your own experiences and your own revolutionary practice. Instead, you are reproducing the esoteric language that separates us from the people, alienating our people. A few people clapped hesitantly. The rest of the room sank into silence. This is a true rupture in communication, he continued, a recolonization of the uses of the language of the right to describe the grave social reality of the poor. The words of Linares struck a chord with me. In the days before the occurrence, while participating in the small work group, my frustration had been steadily growing. I had been waiting to hear some reflection of the first-hand experiences of faculty member in the classrooms and in the poor neighborhoods. I had anticipated the training as a space where faculty members' experiences and their practical work could enter into dialogue with theoretical concerns in critical pedagogy and radical epistemology. I had hoped the sensibilization course would give me, the foreign anthropologists attending class sessions and doing interviews with faculty, students, and senior managers, a space to witness the deep personal reflection of faculty members of their classroom practice as they merged into an interesting synthesis. I had expected this to be an opportunity for them to share both excellent practice and difficulties of their work. Instead, the reflection was reduced to using jargon, both the heavy theoretical vocabulary of the academic articles and the target bureaucratic lingo of the official normative documents they were reading. Thus, for a few days, I had been listening with a growing impatience. 
For this reason, my first reaction to Linares' speech was that of relief and renewed interest in what was happening in the room. The silence was tense for a few moments. A few participants looked at each other in a somewhat confused fashion, but most looked down, seemingly embarrassed, like school children scorned by a beloved teacher. At that point, the silence was broken by Mariana Morales, a lecturer in community journalism. A woman in her 40s, she had dominated the discussion group with her imposing figure, vivid gesticulation and deep voice. She had now stood up and faced Linares, who had again taken his seat by the door. With one hand on her hip, the other on her chest, she said, listen to me, professor, and listen well. I work as a lecturer across the Great Plain, Los Llanos. To go to the remote local classroom, Aldea, where I teach each week, I must walk for hours in rubber boots through a river and then climb the mountain with the help of a mule. I'm a community organizer. I work with communities. I don't use this awkward vocabulary you are using in the academic world. It is new for me and my head has been aching over the last few days, but I was told that this is the way to get trained in revolutionary theory so that I do my job better with clearer understanding and consciousness so that I can understand the weapons of the enemy. And I came here and I have been trying to get this into my head. I pay respect to this theory and it is damn hard. So why don't you give us some credit as people coming here and trying to learn for having advanced in understanding and using this vocabulary? Why do you insist instead of making us feel we'll never get it right anyway? The applause this time burst even before the speech was over. With a few exceptions, the UBW faculty were celebrating. A young lecturer from the language training department in Caracas stood up and said it was time they stopped treating the people with contempt for things they don't understand. Because she reasoned, language is out there to be learned and everybody can learn it. Linares looked embarrassed. He sat down and kept silent until the end of the session. My own embarrassment perhaps exceeded that of Linares. I realized two powerful mechanisms at work which I had failed to recognize until that moment. On the one hand, Mariana's opposition went not only against the lack of recognition of her effort to learn theory, which was not a part of her everyday practice. Her voice was raised against much larger contradictions central to the power structure in the Bolivarian higher education field. Pedro Pablo Linares and Mariana Morales represented two distinct, in not, if not opposite, types of experience of the academics and actors involved in the Bolivarian process. Linares was a representative of the mostly male dominated Latin American academic left with its specific charisma. His intellectual and student movement background, his dress and conduct were all speaking of his position within what I would call, in a gesture to Pierre Bourdieu's term, state nobility, the radical nobility of the Bolivarian process. This experience of socialist intellectuals with a radical past who are close to state power provided Chavismo with left lineage from within the radical academic movements. With his presence, Linares validated both the genealogy of the past struggles and the high academic acclaim. Morales, on the contrary, was part of a huge number of female community organizers within the Bolivarian process whose insider access in poor community was instrumental for the state to gain leg legitimacy there. The year he between these two types of symbolic capital clashed in the moment of opposition between Mariana and Linares, a conflict per pertinent to the Bolivarian process and which would potentially emerge in any regime that uses reproductive work, academic credit, and revolutionary charisma to attract support. On the other hand, Morales' vigorous opposition to Linares exposed another contradiction within the Bolivarian process, which I had failed to recognize up until that moment. Coming from the Anglo-American Academy, I had expected that the UBV faculty lived up to the same academic standards I had been socialized in and had taken for granted. It had become natural to me that the mastery of academic jargon was only recognized when you learned it so well that you could do without it. 
Thus, until the tense moment at the teacher's training, I had not realized that the same requirements and the same that their chronic order of learning and earned learning did not apply to my interlocutors, the rank and file faculty at UBV, the new Bolivarian educators. On the contrary, their legitimacy stemmed from doing both synchronically. They were to master the traditional academic vocabulary while navigating and championing the cultural and social codes of their own students and marginalized poor communities to which many of them also belonged. They had to strive to be recognized academics and internalize the academic structure while expected to, in other Lord's words, dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. So this is an excerpt from chapter three of my book. In the book, I discuss some of the advancements, but also serious challenges that the Bolivarian University of Venezuela, here after UVF again, encountered from its inception in 2003 till the death of President Hugo Chavez in 2011. My own curiosity about the socialist education project stemmed almost counterintuitively from an anti-communist stance originally. Born and brought up in a socialist and post-socialist Bulgaria, respectively, I first encountered Venezuelan socialism in London in the early 2000s. As we were told back in Bulgaria, socialism was an absolute evil, and I was struck by a moral panic when I heard about Venezuela. I thought a new totalitarian regime was using higher education for ideological indoctrination. Little did I know. Soon after, however, I landed at the Central European University, which is now in this picture, a George Soros-sponsored, privately endowed English language graduate school formerly in Budapest. And you might rather know it from its next iteration in which it left Budapest for Vienna because it was expelled by the right-wing government. There I became part of a political generation from the former socialist world whose members were experiencing the effect of economic dissolution and dismantlement of the socialist welfare state through the difficulties of finding a job or accessing decent living conditions. The only critical framework that made sense for us to understand this process was surprisingly Marxism, back then surprisingly. After an initial confusion, many of us adopted it as it helped explain our realities and expressed our frustrations. At CEU, I also realized that not only Venezuela used higher education as a tool for social change. Liberal democracy did the same through projects like the Central European Universities. But imagine the universities in a very different and unashamedly elitist pro-Western ways. Coming back from fieldwork in back from fieldwork in Venezuela to Europe in the 2010s, struck by the global financial crisis and with raising student movement movements against the downward intergenerational mobility through toxic debt and ever growing cost of living, I could not help but think of what were the utopian potentials and very real lessons that the Bolivarian experiment can teach us. So when I went to Venezuela, I had two questions in mind. And they were first, what happened when a university or higher education is chosen as a leading institution in the aftermath or you know, of a revolutionary moment? And then the hand and deck questions, the question I think in higher education, and it, which is, is the university a tool just of reproduction of privilege and class, or is it a tool for redistribution and transformative social change? To answer these questions in the book, I discuss my findings from 18 months fieldwork between 2008 and 2011 at the main sites of socialist higher education reform in, Venez in the Venezuelan capital, Caracas. The book outlines the historical origins and then to day-to-day -day functioning of the colossal and chaotic effort of late President Hugo Chavez's government to create a university that challenges national and global higher education norms. I historicize the structural conditions in the peripheral petrol state and individual and collective agency behind UBV, which served as the vanguard institution of the university reform. 
The critical observations and points that the study makes are less to critique the truly magnanimous effort for socially just higher education project itself, but rather to show the limitations that anyone who attempts an, an alternative university project such as UBV might face when putting such a blueprint into practice within the confines of advanced capitalism. To study the reality of UBV, I spent most of my days around the UBV campus in Caracas, attending classes, extracurricular activities and events, and speaking to students, faculty, staff, and senior managers. Occasionally, I would go to the Ministry of Popular Power for Higher Education, which was then renamed for University Education and so forth, and related agencies to conduct interviews, go to localized local classrooms, aldeas in and beyond Caracas, or attend outreach trips with groups from UBV Caracas. By the time I'd finished fieldwork, some of my interlocutors had become friends with whom I would hang out for coffee or meals or attend political and cultural event. Thus, rather than presenting a classroom ethnography, the book shows the different spaces, faces, and phases of a complex reform. I have also combined ethnographic analysis with reviews of historical and secondary materials, as well as political economy based on the material realities of my, my field site as positioned within the global field of higher education. A bit about CEU, uh, sorry, about UBV. So some of you might know everything about it and I believe Jason has even worked there and others might not. So just a few facts and figures. Um, UBV was opened in 2003 around uh, other health, welfare and cultural provision missions or programs for redistribution. The education ones were Robinson one for literacy, Robinson two for secondary education, Rivas for vocational training and Mission Sucre for higher education access of which UBV was the main degree granting institution. Uh, UBV was established in the former offices of uh, like one branch of PDVSA, the, the petrol, Petroleos and Venezuela nationalized um, public company. And um, it quickly enrolled in 2003, 570,000 students through different, through the five main campuses back then in big cities and over 1,300 localized classrooms. It, in the, at least in the um, campuses, it had a canteen, library, extracurricular activities, and classes in indigenous languages and minority cultural heritage. Um, it also had something that was quite unique, which was an outreach program following a tradition in Latin American higher education, which is called Extension, but it used it in a very specific way as applied knowledge to solve, solve social ills. And it meant that each curricular unit would feed into a community organizing project to which the whole classroom would go together. Um, still by the time that I arrived there in 2008, some issues had started emerging. Um, the stipend was just 200 per month, which um, in a time when the minimum salary that was barely enough for living was 900, that's US dollars. And of course the, the um, Bolivar was falling in constant inflation were not enough for students to live independently as full-time students. Um, the services were insufficient and often dysfunctional. The UBV was not given accreditation by state agencies or most of its programs weren't and that jeopardized the opportunity for jobs for UBV students. So now just on the left hand, I will leave a bit the kind of historical context of which I would sometimes refer to certain dates. And on the right is again, the content of the book, which I will now briefly narrate. And then after 
some conclusions, I will open the floor to discussion. So um, chapter one sets the scene in which the book takes place, the contested public space of Caracas. Having chosen the university as a fellow site, I thought I would be sitting in classrooms and interviewing students and faculty, but I encountered a very different reality. The campaign for the referendum to end term limits for President Chavez in early 2009, by then a second mandate in power took place early in my fieldwork, which meant that all my interlocutors did not spend much time in classrooms. Classes were often suspended and students were gathering at Ubaves parking lot and joining what was called the caravans of happiness, caravanas de alegria, organized by revolutionary DJs and cultural collectives to canvas around town. I quickly realized I was doing educational ethnography at a very political university. And the campaign was not only promoting the president, but also a different way of relating to the public and to the state. Because while there was a progressive government in power, that did not necessarily mean that it had power over the state. The structures of the state were still serving big businesses and foreign corporations and the elite in the country. The government often lacked the structural power to produce profound reforms. Yet it had another weapon. Revolutionary art and community organizing were two effective ways to relate politics to the people, for people to start seeing the government as present in everyday life. Chavismo had at its disposal the bodies of activists who were part of present at and engaging with poor communities. They would redistribute freely leaflets, books, music, CDs, T-shirts, bags, baseball caps, shoes, and other paraphernalia. As part of the symbolic redistribution of the petrol rent and access to the affective world of the revolution. I stopped thinking of universities solely as providing classroom education and started seeing them as expressions of larger political processes a field of class struggle over the relationship between state and people. And of course, commercial universities also invite a lot of um, actors on their campuses, but we see them as non-political, you know, so they're presented, like recruitment companies, uh, job fairs, all sorts of um, outsourced uh, actors that provide coffee, catering, and what, whatnot. Chapter two discusses the open wounds of Venezuela's recent history through a focus on the idea of academic autonomy. In contemporary debates, academic autonomy has been utilized by movements fighting autocratic regimes, hence the term has been connected to politics, but very rarely to the market. The Venezuelan case epitomizes the pitfalls of such an approach. The student left used autonomy to resist repression during Venezuela's liberal democracy. This happened especially in the 1970s through the university law, which left autonomy to a handful of old universities, but produced a second tier universities called experimental, in which the government could intervene. Yet after 1998, the former supporters of the parties which had violated that autonomy started to capitalize on it in order to block the progressive reforms. Prior to the attempted coup d'etat in 2002, a very small Venezuelan elite benefited from public higher education while working primarily to place Venezuela's crude oil and the related knowledge infrastructure at the service of international corporations. The 2003 general strike of petrol workers clearly exposed this alliance. The Bolivarian government's decision not to interfere at autonomous universities, but to create a parallel Bolivarian university system as experimental, contributed to further stratification of higher education. This episode is a reminder that even in advanced capitalist democracies where academic autonomy is allegedly untouched, universities often prioritize market principles and place education at the service of businesses. Within this conjuncture, the concept of academic autonomy played a somewhat perverse role in Venezuela. Socialist academics were very reluctant to go against it and to infringe upon university autonomy, while opponents of the reform to redistribute higher education to the poor utilized it to protect their privileges. 
So the paradox, the decision to create a second tier of institutions instead of intervening at traditional universities meant abandoning key sites of struggle against capitalism. Chapter three, from which I previously read, zooms on this concept of the radical nobility of former militants from traditional universities who joined the elections of state power, uh, the echelon of state power and UBV management. Um, often, and, the, and their kind of frictions with the new Bolivarian educators. The latter were often first generation into higher education and lacked both the traditional academic and radical credentials of the former radicals, which merged into what I call a revolutionary capital. Rank and file faculty had to perform two tasks at once to challenge academic conventions while also trying to accumulate traditional university credentials to gain formal university accreditation for UBV. Chapter four focuses on the power asymmetries in teaching and learning processes at UBV. While many faculty were struggling to adopt critical pedagogy, most students held in high esteem charismatic male academics who used traditional instruction methods. Meanwhile, UBV students evaluate uh, elevated expectations for upward mobility were stifled by Venezuela's unreformed job market. The disappointment with the job market was partly subverted by UBV's hidden curriculum, according to which students from poor communities were to place highest value on working with their own community for social change. Here I find Samuel Hurtado's work on the matrilineal connections and the ways in which poor communities are reproduced through a cluster of households of single mothers, very um, insightful. And um, what's important is that at, at some point, um, I started realizing that a lot of times, whereas in the classrooms, the classrooms were dominated by um, usually male professors with the past in the radical movement, the actual um, kind of experience of going to communities and doing community work, which was the main purpose of the education of, of Bolivariana, was carried out on the shoulders of women in the poor communities, but they were extremely burdened with a quadruple burden of being usually single mothers, very often um, workers and breadwinners within their household. They would also be the ones that would be setting the community kitchen, the community radio station, and also receiving uh, groups from the from the regime. So whereas they were engaged in the revolution 24 seven, the revolution brought them huge symbolic gain as many felt empowerment, but also um, it meant that, uh, you know, like for them, there was very little material redistribution. Uh, still, they incorporated the revolution in their community, where unlike before, the state didn't come with the police uh, power, but um, came with a familiar body and voice of a relative or neighbor dressed in her red t-shirt. Um, so chapter five narrates the emergence of a student movement of UBV, while the contradictions of the Bolivarian process were becoming more apparent it faced no serious resistance from within. In admiration of the former student militants from the radical nobility, UBV's faculty yearned for a student mobilization at the Revolutionary University. Yet when a student movement articulated its critique of the UBV's management, it was quickly rejected by the faculty as a legitimate heir of the past student movements. Following closely the rise of and fall of one such movement in 2009, I show a problematic mechanism at play in revolutionary processes. The tendency of institutionalized radical movements to position themselves at the top of a radical hierarchy and suppress imminent critique. I claim radical regimes reach their limits if they fail to challenge revolutionary hierarchies and nurture critical feedback. The epilogue, and I, we can speak about the conclusion maybe when we discuss or just briefly go through the epilogue, is a bit of a discussion 
kind of engaging more with partly the decolonial literature, but partly uh, it's an uh, auto reflection of the lessons learned between state socialism in Eastern Europe and Venezuela. Um, I found out that there was very little reading of what happened beyond very specific moments of the Soviet Union, let's like, say the early days of kind of Lenin's writing. And there was thus very little lessons run, but that was less the, the kind of fault of anyone in Venezuela or respectively in Eastern Europe where nobody almost cares about what happens in Latin America. And it's more a question of um, a, a kind of way in which area studies has compartmentalized the peripheries of the world system and has placed us into speaking only in our own sound chambers to discuss our big national problems, as Claudio Lomnitz would say. Um, and so these old Cold War divisions get reproduced through job market mechanisms. And partly, you know, and I will finish here, partly that is why a book like this coming from me took 10 years to write or more after finishing my dissertation. Because going on the job market as somebody from one peripheral region, um, I was always seen as nationally Bulgarian and was recruited into jobs that would send me either to my na native land or to any other context because I can easily adapt, but would not see me as somebody that can be knowledgeable in any way about Latin America. And that was left to Latin Americanists or to people from the global north. So I'm challenging a bit this dichotomy with the, with the epilogue. And I think, uh, you know, it's very late for me and it's late enough for you. So maybe I will just finish here and open up to discussion. And thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> thank you, Maria. I appreciate everything you put on the table there. Really fascinating, my goodness. Um, we have around 15 minutes or so. Um, and at that point, it'll be two in the morning for Maria. So we don't want to go too much further than that. But uh, you provoked a lot of thoughts that I had. And um, a couple of people had to hop off, but wanted me to express their thank you to you as well. So are there any questions or comments based on what we heard? And if you want to make a comment, uh, we're a small group. So you can just unmute yourself. Or if you feel more comfortable, you can type stack. Um, you can also just write your comment. I actually have one question while we're waiting, if you don't mind. Okay. I have a lot of questions, but um, one that I was very curious about, where you mentioned in, in one of your slides that one of your key questions was what happens when the university becomes a key institution in the aftermath of the revolution? Um, and I was wondering, to what degree was it a key institution in the production of revolution? Or was this something that um, was created post-revolution in a different form? I'm just, if you could say a little bit more about the relation between the before and after, I'd be super interested in hearing more about this because you also make a point, I think that's really important that the university is a site to struggle against capitalism. I'm assuming, but I might be wrong, that it was also a site of struggle prior to the revolution against capital, but maybe you could say more about that. Yeah, so the way that I was dealing with it, so I, I kind of, when I went to Venezuela, I wasn't thinking in such a long historical um, kind of perspective. I was thinking more, you know, what's happening there and, and why all of a sudden there is a socialist regime that should be fighting against distinctions and, you know, class reproductive mechanisms and it takes out a, a university as a first weapon in mm -hmm. the struggle um but but then you know there, there are a couple of things that that become clear you know one one is that um even if Chavez himself I mean he was highly educated but he wasn't a, a universitario like so he wasn't an academic per se uh he had a master's degree from uh you know, university that's very connected, and especially department that's very connected to the right, it is the political science department mm -hmm. at uh, Simon Bolivar Bul University. But um, what is uh, kind of interesting is that um, 
a lot of the people that supported him, especially after 2001, when he introduced a number of uh, very progressive reforms, were people who, for whom being radicals was facilitated by the autonomy at university campuses and by the higher education that they received, be it at Venezuelan universities or at universities abroad. So, um, so there is a, a kind of lineage within the Venezuelan and Latin American global left, obviously, and with massification of higher education even more so, in which um, universities become some kind of oasis of free thought, speech, and so forth. Um, that that facilitates, uh, uh, you know, on the one hand, you know, certain sociality and interaction, but on the other hand, that that might become problematic. And I showed the mechanism through which it becomes problematic, because together with the what they call the radical credential, also traditional credentials get kind of filtered through into the new system, or rather, don't get filtered you know, and and remain prevalent in the new system. So the so then the class struggle kind of almost transposed itself within the institution, but it was prevented because. There wasn't a kind of space to say that, oh, you know, these are the old privileged people from, and there were, you know, people with a lot of time in the struggle. So it was very difficult to kind of claim that what they're doing is not radical enough, or what they're doing, you know, reproduces some kind of systems. So, so it it became one of the key uh, problems, as far as I could see, that that I think at the end. Um, yeah, produced silences rather than, than openness and spaces for discussion and critique within within the institution. And if I heard you correctly, and then maybe some other people have quite it was the faculty themselves that silenced some of the yeah. critical reflection. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, and and I'd say you know, so so it wasn't like that. Say the people that I call the radical nobility, that they were only in the ministry and the senior management. They were some of them senior faculty members. Um, that was necessary because otherwise the university would never get accreditation. Their publications, their fundraising, their credentials, their PhDs were vital. And that is why, you know, that was the other point that I wanted to mention. It was very difficult to think that you can produce a university um, call it a university without it immediately being inscribed into all the hierarchies that being a university requires. And this is where it became a very difficult, um, a very difficult kind of problem because, um, and on the one hand, you needed those old credentials. So they tried through certain reforms to kind of reduce a bit what is needed in order to get promotion, in order to be accredited as an academic. But on the other, there wasn't a kind of production of complete alternatives of what exactly it requires. And even if you could produce it internally, the moment you kind of open it up, even outside in Latin America, it was impossible to, to create a hierarchy that fits into anything that is considered higher education and that is then considered on the job market as qualifications that would make people from the poor communities eligible for jobs. And this is one of the selling points of the university at the end of the day. So it, it became a really tricky kind of um, wow. mechanism. Wow. Uh, Justine, please. Hi, yes, hello. Uh, really fascinating work. And I'm actually like really excited to read your book. <laughs> um, I am a... PhD student at um, Arizona State University in a program called Justice Studies in the School of Social Transformation. Um, and I think thus that name and the program itself speak to this way in which the university picks up these radical languages, right? And then uses it to be like, look, we have all of these different perspectives, but then through that department or through that program, right? It really kind of controls 
that narrative and also controls the way in which students can learn about these uh, like radical perspectives and all these things. So um, my research looks at the role community colleges play or how community colleges are shaped by racial capitalism and the role they play in reproducing it because it's a space that's often seen as like the social justice harbinger of higher education because it's affordable and all of these different things, right? So just to give a little context in pure academic form, right? <laughs> to, uh, to get to my question, um, I noticed your book talks about um, the increase of academic precarity, right? And I'm thinking about the increase of both adjunct labor alongside the increase of student loan debt um, and the way in which faculty um, can sometimes, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of like, um, the way, so I guess what I'm kind of getting at here is I've heard my, my fellow workers, I also teach at a community college um, as, as a residential faculty member, talk about themselves as something other than workers, right? They've said things in which like, oh, we are not typical workers because we have an interest in maintaining the public good or maintaining the public interest. And I think that's very interesting because what do other workers have <laughs> their interest in, right? And so I guess what I'm kind of getting at here are what are the ways that you see as effective ways to kind of overcome this idea that we are not workers? Um, and how do you, maybe social movements or um, the work that you saw happening in Bolivia out, or, uh, at this university out on the ground, right? What can we learn about how to organize around those types of ideas so that they're not getting in our way when we're trying to organize our workplace? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the, the million dollar question in a way in, in contemporary um, precarious struggle. So the, the one thing that is, you know, the, the book is partly framed like this because when I came back, you know, was I, I ended up in a, not only in a precarious job market, but also I became a researcher of precarity in labor relations. And that meant also an activist around them. And and for me, that there, there's a couple of things, you know, like one is that it is absolutely imperative that the language of workers is introduced, you know, reintroduced. I know the, you know, a lot of people kind of try to, presented as we are professionals, you know, that, that there's all sorts of entangled ways to try and show uh, privilege, you know, like that's, it's, it's, or, you know, signal virtue. And, and this is where exactly, I think the, um, it, the kind of fight, first fight is that, you know, over language and, and how we're going to frame that. But the, but my, my kind of other issue is, so a lot of the, um, the, the kind of, um, work that I have developed and the, I've worked, I was a president even of the European Association of Social Anthropology, where we did a lot of anti precarity work in, also on European level, was to see which are the structures that reproduce precarity. Because I think a lot of the uh, narrative about precarity has now focused on individual misery stories, you know, like which, which is, it's, it's true, it's sad, people die, people suffer, but um, it doesn't help. You know, on the contrary, it produces um, numbness. You know, we're we are saturated with these stories of, of the adjunct, of the precarious faculty, of the postdocs in, in, in Europe. And, and by individualizing it, then it becomes, uh, you know, like the death of, you know, like the surviving academia. It becomes this kind of individualized narratives Whereas uh, we need like language of collective bargaining and we need structural analysis that, that attacks the issue at its heart, which is where does the money, you know, where, where are the flows of capital that allow the university to produce precarity in a time when they need more faculty because the, higher education is massifying due to the fact that they're also increasing fees and trying to extract more and more. So, so we started doing more, and I see Carol, I'm just gonna finish now very quickly, and you know, maybe we can come to that if there's time. But you know, like for instance, in Europe, it is the question of project. So we we've turned all public universities into kind of teams that are trying to bid for grants. 
And in order to bid for grants, you need somebody to do research for you as a permanent faculty and somebody to teach instead of you. And that means two precarious person for one. For each project that you have, you have at least two people that are doing adjunct type of labor. So is there a way then to attack not only universities and their hiring practices, but also uh, funding bodies that that make these stipulations that don't uh, kind of guarantee labor? Because otherwise we, we go into the other thing, which is this discussion of, oh, there is life, there, is, there are green pastures outside of academia, which is fine. But the problem is that the job market outside of academia is even more shit. You know, if it is possible, of course. So, you know, good luck. Carol, if you can say no. <laughs> yeah, hi, thank you. That was such a helpful uh, response and a wonderful talk. I'm really looking forward to reading your book. So um, Jennifer Turpin, who was on the call earlier, is my uh, colleague. And we we're both looking at exactly what you were talking about, the kinds of structures that are reproducing precarity and inequality uh, in higher ed in the United States. But we, we spent some time at Mondragon in um, the Basque part of Spain. Uh, and I'm just wondering, what, what is the structure of the university? Uh, you know, are there, when you think about the alternative university you've been discussing, you know, is, it, is the power structure um, more equitable? Are there ways in which the institution itself is designed in a more equitable um, way? You know, in the U.S., there's it's such a hierarchy. <laughs> it's really the board or the president. They have all the power. Um, and, you know, and part of the financialization of higher ed depends on that. So just wondering if you talk a little bit about that and alternative structure for higher ed itself. Yeah, I mean, in a way, like the the limit of the book is that you know it is. Whereas I'm using a kind of utopian moment, I'm also finding the contradictions as as I go. And part of it is, you know, like when the when the university started, at least in the campus in Caracas, they were trying to do, um, you know, everybody was taking care, everybody was cleaning, everybody was painting. You know, they were trying to kind of have more of a circu circulation of labor rows in order not to have this stiff hierarchy of you know now i'm going to i'm going to be doing the intellectual work and you're going to be doing the manual labor and a lot of the students were workers as well at the university you know some of them or rather a lot of the workers at the university were also students at the start but that that then kind of disappeared over time and in fact sadly the the university the, the alternative university had less democratic structures in terms of selection of students' representatives. It only had one representative for the whole of the um, you know, student body than traditional universities. And there were no elections. There was a kind of very weird self-nomination process. So, so in a way, um, there are ways, but I think, you know, like within the confines of contemporary society, it is democratic, democratic structure accountability and this idea that um you know like we should try and break up a bit with division a bit or a lot with division of labor and think of what it means that different roles are redistributed you know maybe over time within the university because otherwise it's very difficult not to have you know um position congealed and uh, people accumulating capital for specific type of work rather than other and i i personally would love to see some you know full full profs that only do do research kind of take some more <laughs> ministry <laughs> roles or um but that is you know like that is still within the confines of of the current university and then for me the question the kind of bigger question with which i came back you know from from Venezuela to Europe. And I realized that a lot of the, sadly, a lot of the movements at present, you know, the, the kind of radical imaginary is quite contained to the level of, oh, it wouldn't it be great if poor people go to Oxford? But that doesn't mean that we dismantle Oxford as an imaginary, you know, as a, as a structure of desire, be it, you know. Um, and, and I think, uh, 
like strangely, you know, say the UK higher education system where you, before the introduction of fees and uh, and rankings was actually quite egalitarian or the German one, you know, like where you didn't have a such absolutely leading universities beyond maybe this one too, but, you know, having university education mattered to be in certain types of profession and didn't make you a better person per se. You know, so now this has almost uh, like shifted in very perverse way in which there is seen almost like there is a value in being a university educated human, which I don't know, especially with the current education, if it is the case, because it is so technical and employability kind of harnessed. And at the same time, um, you know, you're, you're having this uh counterintuitive you know like there is no moral really moral education really political education for the most part or it is not encouraged at least uh but you are somehow considered in society as having bigger value which is you know quite quite a uh, an unfortunate thing that i think needs to be dismantled in order to start speaking about any alternative structures in at university thank you that was that was wonderful <laughs> Yeah, and I want to thank everyone for coming out. I want to thank Maria for everything you gave uh, to us tonight. I also really need to read this book as soon as possible. And thank you so much for sharing with it. I can't wait till you're back in the United States. Um, again, there's so much to think through with your work, and I appreciate all the work you're doing, both as a scholar, as an activist, and it was great to share some time with you earlier. I want to let everyone else know that we have some other um, events coming up with Jubilee School in our War and Debt series. We have a really interesting talk from Nazia Kazi next week about um, Islamophobia, student debt, and American empire. And then we have another presentation on the University of Puerto Rico and some of the struggles uh, happening in Puerto Rico around debt and the attempts to um, take back the University of Puerto Rico itself. So we'll be joined by the head of the labor union there, Maria. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out. Um, thank you all for uh, doing what you do. And uh, Marie, if you could stay on for one second, I know it's super late. And everyone else, have a really nice night and um, take care of yourselves and hopefully see you again soon. Take care. Thank you.